Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. Engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Hi, everyone. This is Fei Wu, and I am the creator of Phase World Podcast. To remind you, Face World is a platform where I ignite sun and unsung heroes from all walks of life. So about every two weeks, I feature a new special guest and help tell his or her story for the first time, or second, third time with a different lens, different angle. But why Face World? It's about how people think and how they choose to live their lives. Just because we are free. Doesn't mean we think and live freely. Just because we are rich or wealthy financially doesn't mean we are pursuing an authentic, happy, and fulfilling life. Everyone has such a different approach in answering the same questions. Not every person has yet succeeded or reached their goal. Many are still in the trenches, still trying to figure things out. So, what I call these conversations to be moments of courage. I feel so privileged to be there with them. Sometimes there are tactics, tools, quotes that are easy to take away, but there are also tips and advice that have to come out of a more extended and intimate conversation. It takes a few pauses, struggles to get to the truth, get to the bottom, the truth of why some people forget everything and run versus some people face everything and rise. Today on Phase World, I would like to welcome Katie Whalen. Katie is the noter in chief for the Lightning Notes, a website that delivers short daily posts to help us move the world forward. It features striking stories and great ideas to remind us that we matter. Improving the world is our matter. Katie is not a writer by trade or training. Not long ago, in fact, that she was a senior foreign policy advisor in Congress. After four years of working there, she decided it was time to take a dream deferred and put it out into the world. In part one of my interview with Katie, we explore a life well lived in D.C., including what it was like to work on Capitol Hill and be in the trenches with other people day in and day out. We had the opportunity to dive into Katie's routine and daily life as a senior foreign policy advisor too, a profession I knew nothing about before I spoke with her. Part one is also when you experience a sliver of Katie's desire in figuring out what she wanted to do next. This is what I consider a foundation piece before we jump to part two. So in part two, we unveil the journey of Katie's moving from D.C. to Brooklyn, New York, transitioning from a comfortable life, envious career, stable income to what she calls a total white belt. Katie discovered the magic of having abundance in other parts of her life, such as creativity, inspiration, entrepreneurship. Speaking of inspiration, Katie gives a lot of credit to the one and only Mary Oliver. Mary is a poet, a writer, and has written everything people already talked about. But Mary said that she pays very, very close attention to the world. In the lightning note, Katie captivates people, places, and things. That move her and help her become her better self. So, without further ado, please welcome Katie in part one of our interview. Enjoy. So, Katie Whalen, is that how I should say your name? You got it. Great. So you're the founder and noter in chief of the Lightning Notes, which is a short daily post to help us move the world forward. And what I like, you know, when you describe your mission here is to remind us that we matter, and improving the world is our matter. So, tell me a little, little more about. Sort of your your mission here, and just maybe introduce some of my listeners here to to who you are and what you do with that statement. Sure.、Um, well, I'll back up just a little bit. So the writer John Irving has this wonderful idea that every writer only really has one story in them to write. 
And I think that's actually really true for a lot of us that, you know, filmmakers or rabbis or preachers, that, that we've all got this one thing in us that we want to share with the world. And for me, across every job that I've had, that thing is reminding people that they matter. Because I think it's so easy, Faye, to walk through life and feel like we're irrelevant. There are so many things, just the sheer population of the world alone would suggest, like, what is one person in over six billion? What kind of a difference does that make? Um, so in the in the work that I've done, be it I, um, I did some work in India and co-founded a school there, and then I worked on Capitol Hill in Congress as a policy advisor there. And now with the lightning notes, it's all been this like constant effort to remind people that they matter. Um, because I think we all hunger to matter and hunger to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really easy to lose sight of that in sort of the flotsam and jetsam of daily life. So the current iteration of that is the lightning notes, which is, it just as you said, it's a short daily post to help us move the world forward. So what it does is it takes really great ideas and striking stories to remind us that we matter and, and this is for me is the really key part, and that improving the world is our matter. Because I think once we remember that we actually make a difference, that we have an impact on this blue and green planet, mm -hmm. then I think we have to use that impact for something that's larger than we are, whatever it might be. You know, it could be being, um, you know, really engaged in climate change or racial racial justice or um, you know being the best hedge fund manager you can be I mean there's no particular form for what it is but just to contribute to something that is bigger than um, each individual life so so that's kind of the the lightning notes in uh, in a bit of a frame right there and it's brand new it's only been alive Faye, for seven months I know it's super exciting and you you know I started reading uh, feedback on it and I could just tell very easily how much passion that you've put into this project and it, and it's you know what I'm I guess what I'm trying to say it's very 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 personal um, mm. and I think Seth Godin once said that you know like an artist will make everything they create very personal um, it's there to have a statement and it's it's very authentic it's very purely you and I wonder, you know, where where do you typically source, uh, you know, these content from? I notice that you reference a lot of them, and then you write a lot of the content, curate a lot of content as well. So how how is that creative process, I guess, at a high level looks like? Oh man, <laughs> that is such a great question because it has been so iterative. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, one of the things is I'm not a writer by by training or by background. Like up until uh, April 1st um, of this year, I was a senior foreign policy advisor on Capitol Hill. So the writing that I was doing was um, I was writing memos on Syria and Assad and the refugee crisis and uh, writing a lot of emails about like oh scheduling God. meetings. So I wasn't doing a lot of creative writing. Um, and we can sort of speak about, about that transition as well. But um, certainly for me over the past seven months, it's been a real um, process of discovery um, because I think everything that I'm writing about, so the, the main subjects of the lightning notes are the things that I think hold us back. So doubt, fear, convention, comparing ourselves to others, mm -hmm. greed, envy, all these things that I personally, Katie Whalen, am struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I take a lot of uh, of inspiration from Mary Oliver, who's just this wonderful. Oh, sort of I love her. Oh, isn't she just the best? She, Faye? she was interviewed by uh, um, Krista Tibbet very recently, <gasps> and that was like a magical episode. I yes. had no idea who she was, to be completely honest. Mm. And and then uh, it's amazing. Have you listened to that one yet? I have actually, and yeah. I thought I was just. She's just such a. Um, Ah, uh, you know what? I, I don't like. I uh, words fail me in describing Mary Oliver, which is probably I, appropriate because she is the master wordsmith. But yeah. I think one of the things, Faye, that she talks about is so she her primary palette, you know, her primary, I should say, subject matter is nature, which has been poet subject matter for you know centuries and centuries and centuries. And I remember once an interviewer saying, you know. 
Miss Oliver, like you write about stuff that everybody has already written about, but you do it in such a different way. Like what, what's the secret here? How do you crack the code? And Mary Oliver just said very plainly, she said, I pay very, very close attention. Mm-hmm. And I, so for me, that's really where I try to source a lot of my material is just by paying attention to myself and, um, and my own experiences of walking through the world, but also to other people and paying attention to the things that really move me and like inspire me to be um, a larger, better, bigger iteration of myself than I am right now. So like one example is there's this great story of Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan, where um, it's the it's 1960s and Bob Dylan is beginning to make his uh, transition into like using an electric guitar. And, you know, he is this like folk hero at this point. And the folk music community is like, really rattled by this and so um sing out magazine was um was this kind of preeminent publication um in uh in the folk music community and the editor wrote this open letter to to bob dylan saying like you know in so many words like you know you've walked away from your roots like you know you're following the dollar how could you do this Mm -hmm. and um Johnny Cash reads that letter and Johnny Cash does not know Bob Dylan at this point, but Johnny Cash reads that letter and responds with his own letter to the editor of Sing Out Magazine saying, shut up and let the man sing. (laughs) And it's just this moment where it's like getting into the trenches with somebody else who's like suffering and walking along someone who's been beaten down or, or beleaguered. So it's just little things like that, Faye, where I'm reminded of like, how um, how astonishing our lives can be and how these little moments, like these kind of little little micro moments where we make a decision to like, you know, put a hand on somebody's elbow or actually to like stop and listen to that musician in the subway and maybe actually even put in like a dollar to her, you know, trombone case or whatever it is. But it's those little moments of human connection that I think are so transformative um, and that I'm always trying to pay attention to um, because I think you know it's easy to be heavy-handed and say you need to pay attention to like connection and how amazing it is that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west that's like you know uh, (laughs) great like that's a great way to lose people but I think if if we're reminded of these little uh, little opportunities that we have each and every day to just be a little bit bigger than um, than we usually are to to be the people that we want to be um, more than maybe what our daily routine allows us to. Um, I think that's really powerful. And I think that does remind people that, or my hope is that it will remind people that, you know, you being here matters and it matters to all of us. It's like Barbara Kingsolver talks about, you know, every life is different because you walked this way and touched history. Mm. I really like that. And I think, you know, as you're saying this, it just reminded me of our very brief conversation a few days ago when we were first introduced. And I just felt this urge to introduce someone like you, you know, a young woman um, who I feel like, you know, especially for my podcast, there's a strong theme of uh, women topics and, you know, women in basically in our generation coming out and daring to do, to be different, to do something uh, completely different and to be honest I feel like we are also empowered to do that because I uh, you're still in your 20s I'm in my early 30s and we've had our experience you know we had our education and mm. you know uh, in you know I remember you wrote down about four four or five years of working in Congress so you've interacted you've come across uh, a lot of you know sort of different people different mentors that you can learn from and from mm. this point on, I feel like you're really in in a wonderful position to do what you do today. And then today it was so funny as I as I mentioned before, I was you know had dim sum with family and and I drove back on Store Drive in Boston. And for the first time, I was in the passenger seat, so I I looked over at the Charles River, and there was this bridge that doesn't look fancy at all. It's like not even noticeable, and I saw this huge like flyer banner looking thing across in bright red, and all it said was "I dare you." you know? Oh, how fabulous! You know, and I don't know oh. who it was speaking to, but I almost you know I was like, "Is it to the rowers?" I mean, it's pretty cold now, but. Uh, 
and I thought to myself, like one of the reasons that I feel very blessed to be able to connect with you is I'm doing a lot of daring uh, myself in the past Absolutely. year, you know, and a podcast being one of them, um, only one of the many things. Um, but I think daring could really be a theme is the, what my listeners so far don't know is not only you started this project, but you actually quit, uh, I would say a very stable job, correct me if I'm wrong, very stable, <laughs> uh, you know, a very proud, a, a very, very envious job at the Congress. Um, and then do you mind like kind of give us, you know, you, you had mentioned that you want to talk about the transition and I'm personally very interested in that as well is transitioning from a senior foreign policy advisor in Congress. I don't really know what that job entails, to be honest. But then (laughs) what was your daily routine like and how when I assume you started writing even before you quit your job and then, you know, what was that tipping point like? Just be super raw. (laughs) <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. Well, first of all, I just want to say, like, I think what you're doing with this podcast is so exciting, Faye. And it's such a treat um, and <laughs> a real you. honor to, to be a part of it because it's like, it's this beautiful, uh, I'm going to butcher this, but there's this wonderful line from the play Sundays in the Park with George. And um, it's something to the effect of like, you know, you put something out there where there wasn't anything before. And I feel like that's what Faye's world is. And that's like, that's such a beautiful gift of generosity to the world. But it's also like, it's a, a powerful marker of self-respect to do that, Faye. So, I mean, I Thank you. take my hat off to you big time. Thank you so much. I, I really, I really appreciate it. And the more we talk, I feel like you, you, you know, certainly is one of my target (laughs) group targeted audience of you know people our age trying to share the voice uh together trying to create something of meaning together so Mm, absolutely well you know and just i just want to riff on that for a second and then i'll I'll get to sort of the lightning notes origin story um but i think (laughs) we are so influenced by the people and the ideas that we spend our time with um And I think for a lot of people who are like considering taking a risk or taking a plunge or like being true to that sign on the um, bridge over the Charles River of like doing the dare, like that thing inside you that you know could eat you alive if you don't do it. um, I think in those times, one of the most important things is to immerse yourself in communities and environments and thoughts um, from people who are doing similar things. They, you know, they don't have to be in the same field, but who are thinking on that level, who are respecting those urges that they have inside them to like make a change or make a switch. You know, I'm always struck by how um, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien used to um, be in a writer's workshop together. Um, and I think like it's particularly if you're going into something creative or even not, maybe if it's just straight entrepreneurship, which is like a massive feat on, into unto itself, um, being with other people who are in the trenches is so important because they, they understand where you are. You don't have to explain yourself as much. You guys can kind of like hit the ground running. And one of the things I love about Faye's world is it's like, yes, that is it. It is like this intellectual community um, and really emotional support of people who have like taken what could be a dream deferred and made it like a reality in the world. Um, and like, that's just a beautiful um, theme, I think, Faye, to have running through your podcast, which has like had all these luminaries in such a short period of time. I mean, it's just so exciting. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I, you know, I think what I, part of my strategy as I'm uh, witnessing uh, over the past year is to, uh, you know, at the beginning, I thought purely, I'm just going to have people are still in the making of, like, still in the trenches. By the way, those are like absolutely my favorite stories. And people are just so <laughs> honest about their own stories and even perhaps some on the surface appear to be very successful uh, Mm. but they're still struggling in certain certain areas and and they talk about lessons learned and their own struggles uh, you know super raw authentic on the podcast so and and, you know at the same time I you know to your point um, I've interviewed people who sort of let's just say made it or like you know you've been doing it for seven months I've been doing it for a year there are people who have been doing what they do, whether it's podcasts or writing or other things for years and years that you wouldn't even know because you've only known them for the past year or two that they had, they appeared to be successful, but they Mm. had already been going at it for five to eight years. So I'm totally, you know, I'm just so excited to kind of catch you at this like 
magical moment where I'm sure you're going through a lot and your voice sounds very confident but I know just you know what it I personally know what it takes to to do what you do and um and I love to obviously have a follow-up podcast as well like a year you know (laughs) six months a year from from today but I mean this is very special for both of us well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 such a treat, and it's great to sort of take some of your wisdom from uh, a couple months down down the pike. Um, <laughs> but I think so to to get to your question about sort of the the origin story and that transition. So, um, I was a senior foreign policy advisor on Capitol Hill, um, and it's such a great question of like, so what exactly do you do on a daily basis? Because my mother would ask me that from time <laughs> to time, of like, what exactly is your work? Um, it's it's a great question. Um, really, what your what my job was was to take my boss's agenda, and I worked for a wonderful man, a really wonderful man with a heart as as big as they come. Um, but it was to take his agenda and the issue areas that I covered and really like you know continue to move the ball on them. Um, and you know we were democrats in the minority over on the the house of representatives and so you didn't have the usual tools that were at your were at your disposal so you don't control the house floor you don't control the bills that are coming down so so it's hard legislatively to um try and push what your boss boss wants forward but my thinking is like you know if if i'm there if i'm working in this environment and i'm committed to this mission which is sort of uh, taking my boss's ideas around foreign policy and peace and social justice and economic equality, like just because I don't have the regular tools at my disposal doesn't mean uh, that's an excuse to not get stuff done. Mm -hmm. Um, And so a lot of what my days were, we're trying to figure out creatively, how can we still get stuff done given the fact that like, you know, our toolbox has gone from like a full, like a full suite of tools to like four or five hammers and like, you know, some nails. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I love something that I, that I've always loved face. I love building things. Um, and I love creating things. I might not be the world's most awesome manager, but I do love starting stuff. Um, <laughs> and so I, I'm working on my management side. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I love to look out on the horizon and see where isn't there something and is there an opportunity to create something that's going to be beneficial for the mission that I'm pursuing, which is my boss, you know, my boss's agenda, um, as well as to sort of connecting it to some broader causes out there. So, um, you know, an example is, so my brother, uh, my boss was, um, a big Latin Americanist. He had done the Peace Corps in Latin America and a, a piece of his heart lived there. And, um, and Latin America is not a part of the world that, uh, much attention was being paid to. And I remember thinking like, well, this is a drag, like, you know, how <laughs> am I going to get people to care about this? Because everybody's looking at Pakistan, everybody's looking at Afghanistan, you know, if only my boss cared about that. And then you know, one day walking home from work and thinking, you know, this is actually terrific strategic advantage because there's so many cooks in the kitchen in these hot button areas of the world, but there's really not a lot um, going on in Latin, or not, there's a lot going on in Latin America, but not a lot of people training their eyes on it. So this is an opportunity to like create um, uh, real leadership for my boss because I don't have to fight all these other people off. Mm -hmm. Um, So looking for those like little avenues. And so that was a big part of my agenda was like, you know, creating a briefing series and and really trying to um, to boost him as a thought leader on these area and the this part of the world um, and on, um, you know, the variety of different issues that came up, be it human rights or refugee uh, issues or economic equality or um, so, so that was, a, and then there's a lot of like, um, you know, sort of daily stuff that comes down the pike via, you know, we have constituents who have issues, um, that, that need to be addressed or, um, whatever the legislation is that is on the floor and taking stances on that, um, and continuing, like just continuing to be creative about finding ways to move forward, um, you know, my boss's mission, regardless of, you know, whether or not we're in the majority or the minority. So to break um, that to break that down a little bit, I think yeah. you know what you're describing is uh, I think it's fair it's pretty unusual for somebody in her 20s to experience and and I don't know how many jobs are there in the Congress, but let's just say an average 20 some something year old American 
probably isn't whether it isn't, isn't considering that track at all or it is but you know it certainly is a very competitive landscape to get into um, what is your you know could you kind of break it down for instance in terms of what your daily life was like at the congress mm. like for for instance like when do you wake up you know how long <laughs> how long was the commute i mean did you use the computer a lot were you in conference a lot were you in debates a lot i mean what was mm. it like <laughs> no, that's so that's so great because I feel like I could get so caught up in it and like forget that it's just such a foreign world uh, yeah. for other people, uh, which of course makes total sense. So um, I actually got up at six fifty one every morning um, because I like six fifty one more than six fifty, um, and <laughs> I lived right on Capitol Hill, so I loved um, Faye to go and walk the mall in the morning. Um, and it was, you know, like you'd watch the sun rise over the Capitol. And, and I actually made this promise to myself when I first came to DC in 2009, which is like the day that you don't get goosebumps, um, looking at the Capitol building anymore is the day that you need to step aside. And I actually, I don't, I didn't quite use that, that language. I think somebody else that I talked to later, um, uh, had sort of helped me frame it, but it was just a very strong feeling that I had of like, this is an incredible opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, and the day that it stops becoming incredible to you, or you don't appreciate it as much, you got to step aside and let somebody come in who does. So I would walk the mall every morning and just kind of, I was listening, listening to NPR and like seeing, you know, what were they talking about that was relevant to my issue portfolio. Mm, nice. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then I would get in, uh, I usually get into work. I tried to get into work, you tried to get into work a little bit before nine though. Like, you know, there was a little bit of wiggle room there, but, but you know, uh-huh. always tried to, uh-huh. um, and, um, it, you know, oftentimes the d- there's no typical day um, because uh, the thing about working in Congress is that world events can completely tip your day, like the balance of your day. Things change um, so quickly, you know, depending like, on the news. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, if so, I also the, the thing about working in a congressional office is that you handle these kind of your portfolio is kind of an oleo. So like I handled foreign policy, also handled budget banking, small business taxes and trade. Um, so, you know, there were all, all like oftentimes like a lot of days are just meeting after meeting after meeting. You're meeting with constituents, you're meeting with interest groups around these issue, because, issues because there's almost always legislation coming down that's impacting them or there are rumors of legislation coming down that's, you know, on tax, tax reform um, or, you know, whatever the issue might be. So it's a lot of meetings and then a lot of meetings with um, my boss as well um, <laughs> with, you know, different um different people in those uh, who worked on the issues that we cared about. So he really cared about the Peace Corps. So we were oftentimes meeting with um, people from the Peace Corps or people um, who were in the Peace Corps Advocacy Association. Um, And and like, what a privilege to get to work on something like the Peace Corps, like, and trying to get as much money as possible for the Peace Corps. I mean, that was just like this unbelievable, um, unbelievable gift um, to have that in my portfolio. Um, and your, your schedule really is shaped around your boss. So even if I had scheduled a meeting, um, it, it, everything is backburnered to what my boss needs at that moment, moment in time. Mm -hmm. Um, so the days that we are in session, which is the days when the members are on the Hill, as opposed to back in their districts, everything operates around the boss and everything is much busier. It moves much more quickly versus when they're back in their districts, things are a little bit calmer, um, you know, depending on what time of year it is. Um, so, you know, the day, you know, like in terms of like the middle of the day, like lunch could happen at any time. You oh just goodness. like, you just have no idea. Right. Like wow. it depends. Like, you know, I remember like, um, like there were the, this, when ISIS first really came on the national consciousness's radar, like, you know, there was just weeks where it was like lunch was happening at like three thirty or four, just because it was like. <sighs> That was the only time there was to to actually like literally digest something. Well, do you um, like bring snacks with you? I mean, what do you do to kind of compensate oh, that? Total snacker. Total well, what do you, what do you snacker. what did you snack on? Like, what are like naked? The, or what, so, what are, <laughs> the unfortunate thing is, I am a uh, a very big apple fan, which is not a quiet snack. Um, <laughs> so, like, I would occasionally like duck very briefly out of meetings to like have an apple. I always like sometimes like. 
what, what were some, I was, I'm a big Snapple fan. Um, I always love, I, caffeine doesn't work, or caffeine actually works a little too well on me and I can get too wired. Mm-hmm. So I would, um, uh, there, Snapple uh, makes this like half and half, like this Arnie Palmer that is, has like a little bit of black tea and a little bit of green tea in it. And I think it's probably placebo, but I felt like I would get all wired up drinking Snapple. Um, what, what were some of my other snacks? Uh... I was, oh yeah, another very loud one. Like I loved baby carrots. Um, and so again, like not super user friendly. Very, or, like, very healthy though. This... Yeah, I mean, I would try, you know, um, but uh, it's, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a really, it's an amazing environment to be in. And the, the other thing is like, there's such a high concentration of intellectual capital in DC. Um, and, and that really is the case on the Hill. And while I certainly didn't see eye to eye with a lot of people, like there was a, um, uh, a real intelligence across most people, staff, um, you know, I was working on primarily on the staff level, um, staff that like, even if I didn't agree with them, like I oftentimes um, would see sort of the intelligence and sort of the underpinning in what they were talking about, you know, and maybe it's idealistic and maybe it's naive, but I really do think they, I can't remember if it was Bill Clinton who said this, but that, you know, everybody comes to government because they want to make stuff better. And we might have very different ideas of what better looks like. And I certainly had a very different idea of what better looked like than a lot of the um, a lot of the the folks that I was working with by virtue of the fact that we were in the minority. But like there there were opportunities to find um, little slivers of overlap um, with people who like otherwise you might never see eye to eye on. How successful do you think you're able to kind of uh... Uh, accomplish your your mission because I can tell right mm. away that you're very good at your job but you know and I feel like I, I honestly selfishly have so many questions for Congress and your, your previous <laughs> job but I certainly want to kind of you know uh, get you start talking about the the lightning notes as well um, totally but, you know like what what was it I guess I think, you know, I remind everybody that whatever the job that you have currently, it is almost unfair to ask um, it to fulfill every need. It just won't be. It's not even possible to fulfill every need that you have in your life. And mm-hmm. it's so funny how many people actually go to their jobs and, and thinking and therefore get frustrated and complain that, you know, my day wasn't as, as great as it should have been. But think about like most, most often than not, we're getting paid to solve problems. And, and problems are mm-hmm. sometimes solvable and some of the others are very challenging and you know we might be limited by resources it's always these constraints but uh, to go back to my question is like you know how you know what what did you I think you describe very well like what you loved about your job um, at the Congress but I guess what was that moment of realizing that there may be a need or a set of needs that are, aren't weren't satisfied there and therefore kind of transitioned into your endeavor now? Oh, Faye, that's <laughs> like the $64,000 question. Maybe I should say $64 million question. Mm-hmm. The, so I think I, I thought a lot about this. I don't think there was any one moment. I think it was actually this kind of, I think there was this awareness um, that I had probably starting about a year, year and a half ago, um, that this policy was not the environment that I was the most effective in. Mm -hmm. Um, But I never really looked at awareness head on um, because I think, you know, I I sort of knew on some level, it's like, if I do that, then that means I have to make a change. And I don't know what change is going to look like. So I'm just going to stuff it back under the rug. Um, But it it, it started to get like this kind of drumbeat became louder and louder. Um, And and so um, I, you know, I... um, had uh, had been exploring some other opportunities where I felt like you know maybe I can maybe I can use a different platform to remind people that they matter more um, you know maybe I because I, I just don't know if I've got the constitution for doing that in the policy environment um, and uh, I had this one particular job that I like really had my heart set on um, and it, and it didn't pan out like I mean it, there were many jobs that did, did not pan out, um, but this one in particular. And so I'd, I'd gone away. This was in early January, very early January. Was this in and or I, outside of the Congress? This was outside of Congress. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, I'd gone away for this weekend in uh, early January to the beach in Delaware. And it was 
freezing. I mean, really freezing. Um, and I was walking up the, and down the boardwalk and it was, you know, early, early in the morning. And, um, and I just kind of knew it was like, you know, I'm like, and you know, kind of nursing my wounds and sort of feeling sorry <laughs> for myself. This job didn't work out and like trying to figure out like, so what, what do I look to next? Cause I pinned a lot of stuff on getting this job. And, um, and, uh, and I came home that night and I remember vividly sitting at my desk and being like, just hit by this bus of awareness of like, you've got to build your own platform then. Like if you can't find a platform out there that um, that exists to remind people that they matter, then you have to build your own. And say, it was amazing. It was like instantly I started like listing companies that I wanted to work for and I was going to retail or my I mean, I was doing everything to avoid this thought. But like it got bigger and louder and louder. I mean, this was just all in this one evening sitting at my desk. And so finally... I, I was like, you know, maybe, maybe I should actually really pay attention to, attention to this because it's really loud and, um, and I don't know if I can walk away from it. And so I sent my mother an email that night and I just said, the email just said like, dear bum, I think I'm going to leave my job. Love, Katie. Um, what did she and- reply? <laughs> so that's a great question. I actually can't remember because so this all started happening very very quickly. So like the, by the next day, like I woke up the next morning and was like really serious serious about it. And I I think I knew um I knew it was sort of a I don't want to be overly dramatic about this, but it's kind of like this do or die moment because, you know, Langston Hughes talks about carrying around these dreams deferred in us. And I sort of knew it was like, if I don't respect this now, I might never. Um, and I really, I, there are a lot of things I believe in Faye, but if only's is not one of them. Like, I don't want to take anything to my grave. I want to have like spent every, um, every, every bit of capacity that I was given. I want that all to have been blown by the time, you know, my, my life ends. I love um, that. I, I really do. And then I would just like it kind of, um, you know, that's, that's a great description compared to the other metaphor that I heard, um, you know, sort of from this like very successful female doctor. And she says she considers herself, it's like, you know, like a, like a tube of toothpaste. And at the end of it, she mm. wants to squeeze everything out. She want to have nothing left. And which is very, uh, very different than, you know, a, a different as- aspect of a group of my mom's friends who have, um, young daughters who are like beauty pageants which she absolutely cannot and she finds it so difficult to accept you know watching them grow up and and can you know Mm. watching them consider not only profession but a track of life where you're surrounded by people to say that you know what you have on the outside it's it's all you'll ever have I mean this is the only things uh, that actually matter which I I absolutely love what you said and also what the the doctor told me and um I love that toothpaste it's like squeeze it all like um there's this wonderful choreographer George Balanchine who would say like what do you he would yell this at his dancers so it might not have been the world's greatest thing to to dance with him sometimes but he'd yell at his dancers like what are you waiting for what are you saving for it's all now um you know and and martin luther king would talk about like sort of the fierce urgency of now and i think you know we have these moments where um if we're really honest with ourselves we know we're at this kind of fork in the road um and it doesn't have to be one moment but it could be like a series of them or it can be this like kind of quiet knocking on our soul um and and so (laughs) So I got up the next morning and I was like, it's, it's going to, I'm going to start with writing. Like writing is going to be my platform. I think there's a low barrier to entry. Um, and so I called my mom and I'm like, mom, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to be a writer <laughs> without missing a beat. My mother was like, that's great. Why don't you try writing first? And I like kind of, uh, I like had this moment of like, oh, she doesn't believe in me. Oh God, I'm never going to make this happen. And then actually realized <laughs> that she, what she really, what she meant was like, why don't you why don't you like wade in before you like dive headlong in and like give yourself a little bit of a, a little bit of a runway? And I was like, all right, you mom are onto something, which is always the case with my mother. She is like spot on um, eleven times out of ten. So, um, so I decided I was like, I'm gonna write every day 
from January until March 1st. Um, and if at the end I'm still serious and I feel like I have somebody to, something to say and I feel like I can write pieces that are going to do what I want them to do, which is like bring people into their larger selves, enable people to take these dreams out of their guts and put them out into the world, then, then I got to do this. I got to like jump off. So I would get into work, say, every day. So I, I would still get up at 6.51 in the morning. Um, but I would walk into work. I wouldn't walk them all. I'd walk into work, and I'd go down to the basement cafeteria in one of the house office buildings. And while all the Capitol Police were down there having breakfast, you know, their egg sandwiches and sort of talking about the day, I would be, like, typing quietly in the corner um, and just writing and writing and writing. Um, and uh, and then, you know, like I'd go and I'd kind of walk around the halls and listen to NPR and then I'd go and start my regular day on the hill. Um, and and then like on the evenings, I started building a website, which I'd never done before. Um, I mean, no, I'd, I'd done it a little bit before, but like not like I had I had no expertise to uh -huh. bring to this. Let's just say that. And like very much so in the back of my mind, holding this uh, great Albert Einstein quote, which is something to the fact that it's like, if at first the idea is not absurd, then there's no hope for it. And I was like, this is absurd. This is absurd. There's got to be hope here. There's got to be hope here. Um, and so I did this every day and March 1st rolled around and I was more serious than I had been a month and a half ago or, you know, two months ago. And so I told my office, um, I told my office I was leaving um, and uh, and that I was going to move to New York. Um, and I, I think part of where that came from, this need to like leave my job and leave my city, both of which I really cared for a lot, was that getting back to something we talked about before, Faye, is that I think we're so influenced by the people that we spend our time with. And, and I decided, I was like, I've got so much to learn about writing, about being a creative, about building a website, being an entrepreneur. I want to go to the epicenter of that. Like, I want to go to like where you have people who are like doing the gold-plated gold standard on that. Um, and then a whole bunch of like, you know, other levels of expertise as well. And like Brooklyn was calling. This is what I consider a foundation piece before we jump to part two. So in part two, we unveil the journey of Katie's moving from DC to Brooklyn, New York, transitioning from a comfortable life, envious career, stable income to what she calls a total white belt. Katie discovered the magic of having abundance in other parts of her life, such as creativity, inspiration, entrepreneurship. To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. That is F E I S W O R L D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at Face World. Until next time, thanks for listening.